It's now my privilege to welcome Nobel laureate Professor Bruce Beutler and to thank him on behalf of everyone here for his pivotal role in establishing and facilitating the Ernest and Bonnie Beutler research, research program in excellence in genomic medicine. Professor Beutler, who shared a 2011 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, is an internationally recognized leader in immunology and a director of the Center for the Genetics and Host Diseases at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Professor Beutler and Jules Hoffman of Strasbourg University in France shared the Nobel Prize for their discoveries concerning the activation of innate immunity, the first step in the body's immune response. The late Dr. Ralph Steinmann of Rockefeller University was also honored at the same time. Dr. Beutler is known for his work in unlocking the secret of how the body detects infection and launches an inflammatory response. His current endeavors involve an attempt to identify every gene involved in the response to potentially infectious agents, like bacteria or viruses. At UT Southwestern, Dr. Beutler runs one of the largest mouse mutagenesis programs in the world. He and his group have tracked down several hundred mutations that cause abnormalities in mice. Many of these mutations have important implications in infectious diseases or autoimmune conditions in which the body turns on itself, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Dr. Beutler, a regental professor at UT Southwestern, who holds the Raymond and Ellen Willis Distinguished Chair in Cancer Research, earned his medical degree from the University of Chicago after graduating from the University of California, San Diego. His postgraduate career at UT Southwestern includes an internal medicine internship and neurology residency. During a brief fellowship and faculty appointment at Rockefeller University, Dr. Beutler isolated tumor necrosis factor, one of the most important mediators of inflammation, something that most people in this room recognize. He then returned to UT Southwestern as a faculty member in Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator from 1986 to 2000. Dr. Beutler was elected to both the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine in 2008, this is a long list, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2013. Dr. Beutler's numerous awards and recognitions include the Shaw Prize in Life Sciences Medicine, the University of Chicago Professional Achievement Citation 2010, the Albany Medical Center Prize in Medicine and Biomedical Research in 2009, the Balsen Prize in 2007, the Grand Prix Charles Leopold Meyer from the Academy of Sciences in France in 2006, and Robert Koch Prize in 2004. When you were here, Professor Beutler, two years ago, um, all of us remember one of the most momentous and exciting time with that lecture, give us an update, and we all look forward to hearing your presentation today on finding new components of the mammalian immune system. Professor Beutler. Well, thank you, Jacob. Thanks to all of you for all the very kind remarks you made about my father and mother. Uh, I can tell you they'd be very proud of the program they started. My father would be if he were still around to see it. Uh, one of the things that he said that wasn't quoted today uh, was that the measure of a scientist isn't in the size of his laboratory, but in the size of his ideas. And I think that applies here. He'd be very proud of the portfolio that's been started and uh, the amount of money that uh, was donated, after all, wasn't enormous, but I think it can really light some fires. And uh, like myself, he was the type who liked to listen to diverse science. I think he got rather bored rather quickly focusing just on one small area in a colloquium. He was too intellectually restless for that. I um, would like to give you an update on what I talked about some time ago. And uh, I'm going to let Netta help me here. Thank you. <laughs> 
I think all of us um, here think of biological organisms as machines of a kind, and uh, we would all like to know how they work, just as we would like to reverse engineer a car or a radio or almost any kind of machine that a human builds. And the first step in that, I think, is knowing all of the parts. The way that uh, biologists traditionally find all the parts that are necessary for a biological machine to operate is forward genetics. In other words, we randomly damage the genome of an organism again and again and again. We screen for exceptional animals that have a problem with whatever process we're interested in. And then we track down the mutation and then we understand at last something that we didn't know before. This was traditionally practiced in bacteriophage and in bacteria, then in worms and in flies, and it was fairly heroic as an effort when it came to mammals. In the early days, if one mutagenized mice, uh, which was done even several decades ago, uh, he or she could expect to spend several years tracking down a causative mutation if a phenotype was observed. And this always went through the phases of genetic mapping, physical mapping, and then gene identification, since none of the genome was known in the old days. And finally, one would treat the genes as candidates and look for a mutation that made the difference between the reference strain and the mutant strain. This was a blind process when it began. And the only way we knew that something was really going on when we mutagenized uh, was the fact that we saw very unusual looking mice. Um, we knew we were having a phenotypic effect because of them, but we didn't really know how much mutation we were introducing into uh, the progenitor of a given pedigree. There was wild guesswork about that. Uh, some said the rate of mutation was one in a hundred thousand bases, some one in a million. Nobody really knew. There were some technological advances that accelerated the process, beginning in the early 2000s. First, in 2002, the mouse genome sequence was published in an annotated form, and then it was no longer necessary to perform physical mapping. Genetic mapping was enough, and when you had established a critical region, you had immediately a list of candidate genes, and it was much easier to find a mutation. Still, it could be challenging. There might be a critical region with 30, 40, 50 genes in it, each with seven or eight exons on average. And uh, at some point, we developed a robotic means of covering a critical region. We would make a robot drive sequencing reactions, and we'd go from one end of the critical region to the other, looking at all of the coding sequence. We knew from experience by that time that if we saw a phenotype, almost always, it came from a change in coding sequence. By 2009, at long last, after a very long wait, we knew that uh, we could sequence the whole genome of a mouse in an ordinary laboratory. And this cost, at the time, something between ten and $20,000, but that seemed like a bargain if you could see every mutation. And we generally did that. We would lightly cover the genome to about 3x depth, find the majority of mutations, and then usually there was only one within the established critical region, and that was the causative mutation. Things got much better with whole exome sequencing, however, because then we could go in great depth and even expect to find heterozygous mutations. This opened the possibility of knowing all the mutations in a pedigree up front before the G3 mice had even been generated by inbreeding. The very first mouse born to a mutagen-treated male could then be sequenced. Then we knew how many mutations were brought to that animal from the sperm of the mutagenized father. Uh, we've been at this for a while now and covered several thousand exomes. And I can tell you the average number is 70, uh, the, the, is 63, the modal number, somewhere between 70 and 75, and there's fairly wide variance in the curve, as you see. We're looking here at the number of mutations per sperm, and here at the number of observed instances of that, looking in total at 1,197 uh, whole exome sequencing jobs.
This also opened the possibility of archiving mutations in the mouse. Uh, by about 2006 or so, it had become possible to freeze the sperm of black six mice and then regenerate them by ICSI. Later techniques got even better, and it was possible to do IVF to recreate mice. So it made sense to sequence every G1 mouse. Then we would develop an extensive library of mutations. And beginning in 2011, just a, a little over four years ago, we started to do that. And to this date, we've archived 303,039 incidental mutations that change coding sense. And these fall into 22,476 genes. In other words, we've altered about 90% of all the genes in the mouse, all the protein encoding genes in the mouse by mutation. A total of 24,728 of the mutations make putative null alleles, and the null alleles are falling into 45.6% of all protein encoding genes. So we've managed with chemical mutagenesis to knock out about half of all the genes in the mouse. About 113,000 mutations are either null or judged by Polyphen, a predictive software that looks at the likelihood of damage to a protein uh, to be probably damaging. And these fall into 76% of all protein encoding genes. We tend to take the first estimate, the null alleles, as an underestimate of how much damage we've done to the genome. It's a rule of thumb in our business that if you see a phenotype, it's uh, half as often caused by a null allele as by a missense allele. That's something that's held up very well over the years. So the number of genes that have been uh, mutated to putative null is a gross underestimate of how much damage you've done. On the other hand, the figure Either null or probably damaging is an overestimate. It's far too liberal. We know that polyphen overcalls damage a lot. And uh, we take the exact average of those two as our best estimate of mutation to phenovariance. In this collection, however, we have no assurance uh, for most of the mice that any of these mutations were brought to homozygosity. And uh, that, for a long time, was quite a barrier to progress. A great deal of information was lost because we didn't have a way to effectively genotype all of the descendants of every gene one mouse. The uh, promise of really transparent forward genetics depended upon very fast and inexpensive genotyping so that we'd know the genotype of every mouse born with a certain uh, possibility of having mutations from its grandfather. Furthermore, by 2011, it was clear to us that the rate-limiting step in the whole process of positional cloning was genetic mapping. Postdocs who did the screening were accumulating a lot of mutant phenotypes. They were declaring phenotypes much faster than they could possibly solve them. And the old method of outcrossing a homozygous stock to a marker strain and then backcrossing it, establishing a critical region, and then tracking down the gene was untenable because we were developing a huge backlog of mutants to analyze. Beginning in February 2014, then, we developed a really revolutionary method for measuring the total damage to the genome while simultaneously maintaining surveillance over the function of all genes at a phenotypic level. This allowed us, finally, to map and positionally clone in real time and find instantly, more or less, the uh, mutations that caused phenotype. And I want to tell you quickly how this works. Just as always, we mutagenize G0 mice. We breed them to make grandfathers of the pedigree, the G1. And those, in turn, are bred to make daughters that are G2 and cross to their own daughters to make G3 mice that can be homozygous for mutations found in the G1. But the difference is that now, first of all, we sequence every G1 mouse as soon as it's weaned. If it has more than 30 mutations, we go ahead and breed it. Otherwise, we deem it to be insufficiently uh, mutagenized to follow. At this point, when G2 and G3 mice are born, before anything is done with them, they're genotyped. 
at every locus that's mutated in the G1 grandfather or father. And in this way, uh, we're able to know whether there's homozygosity for the mutations in the G1 progenitor. This means that we must do about 5 million genotypes per year. And so this is quite a major part of the effort. It's done by sequencing with ion torrent sequencing, which is not necessarily that high throughput, but it's nimble. One can turn it around and do a customized sequencing for several G1s per machine per week. Then the mice, as whole pedigrees, are released for screening. And the genotypic data are already resting in the computer awaiting phenotypic data. As soon as phenotypic data are uploaded to the computer, this triggers automatically a search for correlation between phenotype and genotype according to either a recessive or a dominant or, a res or an additive model of inheritance. And uh, the computer then will immediately inform us whether there is a phenotype, first of all, and if there is an apparent phenotype in a pedigree in any of 150 or so different screens, it will tell us the causative mutation. If there's no causative mutation, then we dismiss the phenotype as being some kind of an artifact or non-genetic. Finally, when causative mutations are found, they're verified by CRISPR technology. Either we recreate the mutation or we knock out the gene if we know that it's viable. So this permits, at present in our laboratory, uh, the assignment of cause and effect within about one hour of seeing a phenotype. You see the phenotype, you know the causative mutation. No more need to go positional cloning. And that applies to all phenotypes studied, whether they're quantitative or qualitative, visible or immunologic. And the cost is independent of the number of phenotypes that emanate from a pedigree. Usually there's more than one, given that there are 60 or so mutations and we have so many screens. We don't need 100% penetrance to track down a causative mutation. Very commonly, this is the case, that you have rather graded immune performance, for example, if you look at the antibody response. There will be overlap between affected and unaffected mice. Nonetheless, the computer picks out the correct mutation. Furthermore, we can detect and measure how much saturation has been achieved as a screen progresses within defined limits of errors. And we can exonerate genes. If you happen to read a paper, or if you should happen to write a paper claiming that the knockout of such and such gene does something to such and such immune assay, then immediately I can look and I can see, well, that's very unusual because we have several null alleles of that very same gene and I don't see any effect at all. Uh, so in time, uh, when we've covered all of the genome, uh, nobody will be able to get away with lying about things anymore. <laughs> so what screens do we cover? I have to tell you that in all fairness, so you know what you can get away with and, and what you can't. Uh, first, we simply look at the mice. Then we weigh them, which is a very uh, important thing to do. It's, uh, it's indicative of many, many different minor problems uh, that affect the health of the mice. We do a glucose tolerance test. Uh, to look for uh, resistance to uh, insulin, insulin resistance, diabetes for the most part. We then look at innate immune performance, harvesting the macrophages of mice and checking their responses to various inducers of an inflammatory response. We look uh, also at adaptive immune performance, giving two T-dependent and one T-independent challenge. And we also look for allergies. We look for developmental defects or for activation defects in the blood of the mice by flow cytometry. Then the pipelines are split, and we look for the ability to cope with mouse cytomegalovirus infection on the one hand, or for the ability to repair a subtle injury caused by a very low dose of dextran sodium sulfate. Normally, mice don't have any problem with that. Exceptional mice with certain mutations develop severe colitis as a result. And then the mice go on to certain neurobehavioral screens. We try to get the most out of them that we possibly can. As of today, I looked at our uh, computer and I find that 85,074 point mutations that change coding sense, 
in 18,724 genes have been collected for screening, and uh, almost all of those have been subjected to all of the screening that I showed you. These mutations came from a pool of 44,906 mice that were examined over a period of two years, and those were from 1,587 pedigrees. In all, the mutations were queried a total of 6.6 .6 million times by the computer. That means in every mouse, uh, every mutation, of which there might be 60 possible mutations, was checked in 150 different screens. And so obviously this is a fairly computationally intensive process and it requires a cluster computer to keep it running. We take it somewhat arbitrarily that uh, a good test of the effect of a mutation is to look at it in the homozygous state three times or more. And uh, obviously more than that is even better to detect more and more subtle effects. But uh, for anything really robust, one can generally detect it in that way. And by that criterion, we've examined 10.2% of all genes in a putative null state and 37.7% of all genes in either a putative null or probably damaged state. And all this means that we have essentially examined 25% of all genes in the mouse genome, uh, having damaged them sufficiently to detect a phenotype if one would exist and having checked them three times or more in that state. It's possible for us to project how this will go over time. Uh, at the present time, in the progress of our mutagenesis effort, we're right here. We've uh, created at least a change in something like 74% of all genes. This is the red curve for uh, probably null or probably damaging. This is the curve for putative null alleles, and this is the curve for what I just mentioned to you, mutation to phenovariants, in all cases with three times examination. And so we can see how far we will have to go to get, let's say, to 33%. That should happen sometime around the end of this year, or by the time uh, we've reached a total of uh, 60 8,000 or so G3 mice. Uh, we also can go by the number of G3s, that are, uh, by the number of mutations that have been screened or by time. Uh, all of these curves are predicated on our present rate of screening, which is about 600 mice per week, and that means testing about 1,000 mutations per week. Now, in the course of all this, in any of our screens, we find things that are known, of course. Uh, in the adaptive immune screens alone, I made a list this morning, I see that we've found by phenotype a total of 74 genes that were previously known to be needed for adaptive immune function or uh, response by screening in our mice. Of course, we're not interested in things that are already known, we're interested in things that are unknown. Uh, I would tell you that approximately the same number of uh, mutations that are unknown have also been found and verified in one way or another. So there's a great deal still to learn about what is needed for the adaptive immune response. How do we keep track of all these things? We have to have software that lets us parse all of the mutations and query them according to gene name or screen name or particular groups of mice. We also like to parse according to the predicted effects of mutations, whether they're nonsense or critical splicing errors or other. Uh, we can restrict our search to pedigrees with greater than a certain number of mice in total. We can restrict it to seeing a certain number of homozygotes for any mutation. And we set the p-value of what we believe is significant and wish to pursue. And I will give you an example from the innate immune screens, where we've recently had some success. Uh, many of you have heard of the NLRP3 inflammasome. NLRP3 is involved in most forms of inflammation, uh, very notably in gout, for example, uh, but also in certain diseases. When mutated to a constitutively active form, it causes diseases like cold-induced auto-inflammatory disease or neonatal onset multi-system inflammatory disease, known as NOMID. And uh, it is the 
protein that organizes the processing of interleukin-1 beta, an inflammatory cytokine that's secreted and that helps to generalize the inflammatory response. So we wanted to find all kinds of mutations that affect uh, the NLRP3 inflammasome function, either increasing interferon beta production or abrogating it in response to a defined stimulus. And so here we've focused on that uh, particular screen, and I won't go through what trimmed and untrimmed are. I'll tell you we restrict this search to greater than 15 as the total number of mice in the pedigree. We insist on seeing three or more homozygotes for a mutation, and we set the p-value at 0.005. And then if we click, uh, we find a list of genes. In fact, we get, as of yesterday, 61 mutations in 60 genes from 46 pedigrees. Some of these are always familiar and some are not. Here's one that is familiar. We mutated NLRP3 itself. In fact, we hit the gene nine times in our collection of mutations, making nine separate mutations. Sometimes one has uh, multiple pedigrees with the very same mutation. Usually that's the result of inheritance from a common G0 progenitor. You see the coordinates of the mutation. You see the computer's declarations about it, that it's a missense allele, probably damaging. Uh, we can move over to the right, and you see that there are in this pedigree five homozygous wild type, five heterozygotes, five homozygous mutant uh, mice. And by the additive model of inheritance, in other words, uh, semi-dominant model of inheritance, the mutation passes our criteria for the p-value. If we want to look at all of the mutations, then they're displayed by clicking on that value. And here's the one of interest. And if you mouse over it, you see that this is NLRP3. This is a scale showing the likelihood of association between phenotype and genotype uh, given uh, random assortment. In other words, it has a p-value of nearly 10 to the minus 6 that you'd have that occurring by chance. If you didn't know anything about this gene, you could click on it again, and the computer has already uh, pre-calculated a lot of information for you with links to the MGI database as well, if you want. It's drawn a gene model and also a protein model. This is the protein model in SMART format, and it shows that this is a missense mutation, isoleucine to asparagine at position 293, and this is all interactive in the real model. You can also look at the gene model by clicking there, and you see that the mutation is in exon 5, not predicted to affect splicing. Now, as to the phenotypic data, if you left-click on that point, you see this is the performance of homozygotes, which are poor producers of IL-1 beta, heterozygotes, which are intermediate, and these are reference allele. These are all from a common pedigree and can be taken as litter mates. And the wild type is shown for different purposes, not for comparison. But it was this relationship that made the computer flag the mutation. There are also things that you don't recognize. And many of you would not guess that a protein called NEC7 is important for the inflammasome response. Here we have four separate alleles. This is a nonsense allele. And uh, we see that, in this case, the pedigree is quite large. Um, there are a total of 42 mice in the pedigree. And uh, here we have, again, by an additive model, an effect. If we want to look at the Manhattan plot, we can do it in the same way. We see that this is a member of a kinase family called the NEMA kinases, or never-in-mitosis kinases. And the mutation in question is a premature stop codon. These genes, if you were to read more about it on the page, which you certainly can do, there's a lot more below, are associated with mitosis. They're well known to be required for uh, assembly of the spindle apparatus, and they're known to be involved in abscission of cells during late mitosis, and yet nothing was known about any involvement in inflammasome function. Here are the data, and you see again the homozygotes cluster with very poor IL-1 beta responses, these are heterozygotes, homozygous wild type. Now, uh, that might not be enough to convince you. Maybe you're wondering about all the other uh, pedigrees that we have there and what they show. 
Fortunately, the computer knows this automatically. It realizes when there are multiple alleles and it groups all of the data into super pedigrees. Eventually, all genes will be included in super pedigrees. At present, 61% of all genes have two or more alleles and are in super pedigrees. And with multiple alleles, you gain confidence about the strength of associations. Some super pedigrees are just fantastic. This is a particular unknown gene that I won't talk about today. It affects the number of CD8 cells. We're looking here at a sum across about 16 pedigrees. And in this case, always the same mutation was involved. This was a case where there was multiple transmission to many different G1 mice. Uh, notice that there are hundreds of mutations now. Only one of them is above the Bonferroni correction line. That's the gene in question. And if you click on it, you have color coding of the different pedigrees. You see the CD8 count has shifted quite dramatically compared to heterozygotes or reference alleles. And uh, you wouldn't really need to target this gene with data like this. You could be quite confident that this was the causative mutation. The situation isn't quite so good for NEC7, but NEC7 is above the Bonferroni correction line. And in all, with three different mutations that reached homozygosity, every one of them shows a diminished response compared to heterozygote or reference allele mice. So we can feel fairly confident in proceeding and knocking out that gene. We saw, first of all, that the protein in this mutant, which we named cuties, is practically gone. This is nonsense-mediated decay that destroys it. And when we did knock it out by CRISPR targeting, we found, again, that the protein was gone. Furthermore, that the NLRP3 inflammasome doesn't work. You can activate it with nigerosin, with ATP, with alum, all inflammatory stimuli specific for NLRP3. On the other hand, other inflammasomes like NLRC4 and that responds to flagellin, or AIM2, which responds to poly-DADT, poly uh, do not respond when you knock out uh, NEC7. There's no difference. Uh, so this is not required for their function. We knocked down the gene in human mononuclear cells, and we found that there, too, the inflammasome was suppressed by knockdown with short hairpin RNA from two different donors. Notice that IL-18, as well as IL-1-beta, is suppressed in uh, the case of cuties mice, and or knockout mice as well. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're looking at another endpoint of the NLRP3 inflammasome. We find uh, that cytotoxicity is diminished. This is called pyroptosis, and it's, it's diminished in the case of all of these stimuli. On the other hand, uh, TNF production, IL-6 production, unimpaired in cuties mice. There are two signals that activate the inflammasome. Signal 1 drives the expression of inflammasome components like NLRP3 itself and also pro-IL-1-beta, the target for cleavage by the inflammasome. And then a signal 2 is generated by things like nigerosin or alum. In a somewhat mysterious way, that triggers the activation of the inflammasome. Signal 1 is unimpaired. Notice that with no treatment, you get very little NLRP3 or pro-IL-1-beta expressed. With LPS, the first signal, you get a good response in cuties mice. On the other hand, signal 2 is very much impaired, so homozygotes show almost no response to LPS plus nigerosin or LPS plus ATP in terms of secreted IL-1-beta. Signal 1 is also unimpaired if you look at hallmarks like mitochondrial oxidative radicals or calcium flux into the cell, that's essentially the same in cuties and wild-type mice. We next looked at the uh, assembly of NLRP3 and its association with ASC, a downstream protein that recruits caspase-1, which then cleaves uh, pro-IL-1 beta to release IL-1. This can be followed by sucrose density gradient ultracentrifugation, and uh, we can see a very slight shift in NLRP3 uh, when we do this. 
toward a heavier weight if we activate with nigerosin. Uh, one can also look at ASK recruitment to that complex, and in cuties mice, that's very much impaired compared to wild-type mice. You can also look at the oligomerization of ASK using a cross-linking agent like dextran, uh, rather disuccinimidyl superate. And in this case, uh, you find that with cuties mice, that's also very much impaired. One can see physical association between NEX7 and NLRP3 as well. NEX7 in normal cells, wild-type cells, is distributed like this in a sucrose gradient. And on the other hand, NLRP3 is like that, much more toward the density, high-density end of the gradient. And uh, when you activate, NEX7 largely overlies the NLRP3 band, indicating that it may associate with NLRP3 and be dragged down with it. Looking at how it might interact more directly by expressing tagged versions of NLRP3 and NEX7, we find uh, that, first of all, the whole protein does associate and co-precipitates. Furthermore, if we break up NLRP3 into its pyrin domain, nucleotide binding domain, and leucine-rich repeat portions, then we find that NEX7 binds to the leucine-rich repeats of the protein. In the leucine-rich repeats, in rare cases of NOMID, neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease, there are sometimes mutations that make a constitutively active protein. Two of these are shown here, G775G to A or G to R. And in these cases, those mutations cause tighter association with NEX7. On the other hand, we have in our collection a mutation in NLRP3 itself that diminishes the inflammasome response. And here, it diminishes the binding of NEX7 to the leucine-rich repeats. This mutation is in the leucine-rich repeat of uh, NLRP3. NEX7 is a kinase, but kinase activity is apparently not required for association between uh, NEX7 and NLRP3, nor is it required for NEX7 to rescue the cuties phenotype. If we take knockout cells and transfect them, either with wild type or with a kinase dead mutant expression construct, in both cases, these will rescue the phenotype of IL-1 beta uh, non-production. And finally, in vivo, NEX7 is also required because the cuties mice don't mount a normal inflammatory response to the injection of urate crystals, IP, in terms of recruitment of peritoneal exudate cells or neutrophils or macrophage separately. We have also studied EAE, which is an IL-1-dependent phenomenon, and the NEX7 mutation uh, suppresses that as well. That's experimental allergic encephalomyelitis. Now, we're intrigued by the fact that NEX7 is a kin kinase that's known to be involved in mitosis. And we looked very carefully at cells blocking them at different parts of the mitotic cycle. And we found that during mitosis, you cannot have an inflammasome response. Uh, this is a measurement of the activation of caspase-1 in mitotic cells compared to interphase cells. And we're uh, at least hypothesizing that this really is because of the recruitment of NEX7, an essential new inflammasome component, away to duties that take place during mitosis. And the evolutionary function of this might be to prevent damage to DNA that would occur during inflammasome activation at a time when chromosomes are condensed and when repair can't take place as it would ordinarily do. So we now view the inflammasome quite differently than before. We would say that in response to signal 2, there's activation either of the NLRP3 molecule itself in some way, and there are a number of proposed mechanisms for that. But it could just as well be that these signals impinge directly on NEX7. And whatever the direct mechanism, 
it is clear that NEX7 binds to the leucine-rich repeats of uh, NLRP3 and that that's necessary for activation of caspase-1 and the generation of IL-1-beta, IL-18, IL-33, and then all that follows downstream from that in the inflammatory cascade. Nobody has ever managed to crystallize the inflammasome, the NLRP3 inflammasome. That may very well be because they're missing this important component of it, and that affects the solubility of the molecule. We're attempting to do structural studies now on the complex between these two. So to summarize what I've told you, we've damaged or destroyed about a quarter of all the genes in the mouse and tested the mutant alleles three times or more in the homozygous state, focusing on the effect of these mutations on immune function and some neurobehavioral functions. As phenotypes are seen, we're able to link cause and effect quite reliably, very quickly, like within about an hour. That's a wonderful thing for somebody who lived through the times of five-year positional cloning projects. Uh, to see it happen like that is amazing. There are many new proteins required for normal biological functions that we've identified. We can even make some preliminary estimates of how many essential proteins there are for this or that function based on the fact that we've gone through a quarter of the genome and assuming that large versus small doesn't really matter that much. We can predict that we'll reach half saturation for some of our screens within about three more years at the present rate of production of mice and testing of mice, assuming we can continue to afford it. And uh, in the specific example I showed you, we found a new component of the NLRP3 inflammasome, something very important all by itself, but I assure you that there are a lot more stories coming along. The solution of mechanism still is the limiting factor at this point. It takes a lot of people to do this. You see, I'm going against my father's advice about the size of your lab and the size of your ideas, but uh, in fact, it takes quite a number of people to maintain the pipeline, as I showed it to you, to mutagenize mice, genotype mice, screen mice, do CRISPR knockouts, and so forth. The person who deserved the most credit for the NLRP3 story is He Sin Shi, but no doubt he had help from almost everyone shown here. They all work together very cooperatively. And thanks again for the privilege of, of talking to you and uh, of uh, seeing your work unfold. Thank you so much, Bruce. This was a truly memorable lecture. Brings back memories from two years ago, and but it's even great. I think everyone here is stunned. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussions, and people will talk to you. It breaks here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you.